principal components analysis is a technique for decomposing multi-channel data into fewer channels linearly. What this does is it takes some matrix of data where this is samples on this axis along this dimension. And these are the features along this dimension and decomposes this matrix, fits a space such that instead of having features, you now have, you can now transform this into a matrix of principal components and samples. And the order of these PCs, PC1 versus PC2, right? The rows in here, this is PC1, this is PC2, this is PC3. Each row of the PCs explains less and less as you go down, less and less of the variance of the data of the contained in the original sample. Thus, PC1 is a linear combination of all of the features in your original data set. Such that when combined in this manner, they capture the largest linear component of the variance possible. PC2 is an orthogonal projection of that same data but now that maps the second largest linear combination of variance in the original data set, and so on and so forth. And if this is a full rank data set, then there will be a full rank PC space so that you will have eigenvalues all the way down. So you'll have all of the PCs explaining all of the data. And at the end of the day, PCA is just a rotation and scaling because it's just a linear transformation from one axis of view into another axis of view. Instead of it being in the axes and dimensions that are originally described by the features, it's now in this PC dimension, the principal components dimensions, which are linear combinations of the features that are weighted together. Where this gets useful is that at some point, because this is in order of decreasing variance, you can, for example, cut off your analysis and limit yourself to a restricted matrix of data such that it now only contains, for example, in this case, two PCs. And if these two PCs capture a large fraction of the original variance of the data, then you don't have to worry about a multidimensional system anymore. You only have to worry about a two-dimensional system to analyze and understand what's going on in this data. PCA is considered one of the simplest dimensionality reduction techniques. And it's a linear dimensionality reduction technique that is very easy to understand. Further, it is a direct consequence of building and understanding a covariance matrix. Let's explain what that means. So let's go back to our covariance matrix. We can write our covariance matrix as the capital sigma. And let's look at our three by three case. Or actually, not, not a three by three case. Let's look at a two by two case. Let's look at a two by two case for a covariance matrix. And let's just say that in this example, we have one, one, zero, uh, zero. That means our unit variance is for dimension one and dimension two, whatever these features happen to be, it doesn't matter where they just are, whatever they are, are one and our, covar and our covariances are zero. What this is a model of is a, a data set that is considered fully unit variance, uncorrelated, and it's considered a white data set meaning that it has no relationship. So if you were to plot this data in space, you would end up with a bunch of points that are perfectly 
a line is a Gaussian in every direction in this 2D space, such that if you look at it this way, it's a Gaussian. If you look at it this way and project the data against the x-axis versus the y-axis, both of them are Gaussians with unit variance. That's what this is. Right? There isn't anything else going on in here. White, this is a white data set. So this covariance matrix describes this data set. If we call this, if this is X and this is Y, then that's what this is here. Now, what if we had a, data, a covariance matrix that didn't have that? What if we had a covariance matrix that had a slightly different shape? So this would be for, this is a white covariance matrix, right? Unit variance and zero covariance. What if we have a covariance matrix that describes something like this? It's two, zero, zero, one. In this situation, now let's make this three. Make it a little larger. What would the data look like to generate this covariance matrix? Well, the data to generate this covariance matrix would have a variance of three in the X dimension and still a unit variance in the Y direction and no covariance to each other. So what does this mean? This means that our data is gonna look something like this. Right? It is three times as widely distributed on the x-axis as it is the y-axis. That's what this data set looks like. Everything is centered at zero. I'm just not able to, to draw the data such that it's centered at zero, but this needs to be centered at zero. Why? Because this variance in the x-dimension, if, we if we were to collapse all this onto the x-axis, needs to have a distribution whose variance is three. And in the y dimension, if we collapse it, it's just going back to the unit variance one. And because there's no relationship for X and Y, these covariances are still set to zero. Okay, that's pretty interesting. You'll note that if you were to, for example, calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this, for this matrix, you get something that's pretty interesting, right? The eigenvector and eigenvalue the eigenvectors for this matrix are still, let's put that in green, one, zero, zero, one, right? So we get an eigenvector like this and an eigenvector like that. These are our eigenvectors. What are our eigenvalues? Well, the eigenvalue associated with this X is three and the eigenvalue associated with this is one. Coincidence that this is three times as large? No, definitely not. Definitely not. Keep that in mind because it will come into play. The eigenvalue for this matrix for the one zero vector that's pointing along this dimension is three. And this one is one that's gonna be extremely insightful when we look at our next matrix, which is going to have now a non-zero parameter in, in our space. So let's clear this off and now write a new covariance matrix of three, two, two, three. And now when we write this, what does the data look like? Well, the data for this matrix is going to have variance 
a variance value of five in one direction and one in another direction. That's what the eigenvalues of this are. So first let me draw up the matrix, uh, the data, what it looks like, and then we'll start to analyze this. So it will look something like this. Now, what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, of this covariance matrix? Well, the eigenvector is going to be something like, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn them into unit vectors because it's too much work. Um, it would be root two over two, and I don't want to deal with it. Is one and one for x, and it's negative one and one for y. These are the eigenvectors. These are these are eigenvectors for this for this covariance matrix. Now technically I'd have to make sure that these are all unit vectors to be truly eigenvectors, but that's no big deal. You can just divide this by by um, by root two over two, um, or scale it by by root two to get it to work. But this I'm using this because it's intuitive and easier to understand. What are the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues associated with these with these with these vectors are five and one. I'm not going to do the math. You can work through the math and get these. It's just, it's just uh, linear algebra. The key to understand, though, is to look at this and, and see that if we plot this x, this first PC, as the first eigenvector, right, it points like this. Let's make that bigger and brighter. It points out like this. That's 1, 1. Let's pretend it's on the axis of 1, 1. I don't know exactly what it is. And negative 1, 1 points this way as the second PC. What I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to write it in a different color. Negative 1, 1. That points out this way. Note that it's orthogonal. This lambda is corresponding to this eigenvector has an eigenvalue of five, and this one has an eigenvalue of one. The fact that this dimension, right, this direction of data distribution is perfectly aligned with the greatest variance, right? If you were to draw a line this way, you would say the most amount of data that is changing in this data set is first here. It is not a coincidence that this eigenvector is pointing along that direction. The fact that that value is five uh, for the eigenvalue and it is larger, right? And it's larger than one and it's the largest of the two eigenvalues means that you have just defined the first principal component. And the second principal component is orthogonal to it. And its eigenvalue explains how much of the variance is left. Thus, if the total variance of this is six, because you add the two, the trace of this is still six, right? The trace of this diagonal is going to tell you the total is going to tell you the total variance. Five sixths of the variance in the data is represented by the first PC, and one sixth of it is represented in the second PC. And it will always be this way. Why? Because symmetric matrices like the covariance matrix have eigenvectors that are orthogonal. That is a property of a symmetric matrix. Symmetric matrix has orthogonal 
eigenvectors. The proof is beyond the, this, this video. And so this is extremely powerful. This means that the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix give you the directions of the PCs. They give you the relationship and the weights to assign the linear combinations of one feature and another feature and all the different features such that you are aligned in the directions of maximum variance. And if you sort your, your eigenvectors for your covariance matrix by their respective sizes of their eigenvalues, the largest eigenvalue tells you what the first principal component eigenvector is because that represents the direction of maximum variance. And the second largest eigenvalue and its associated eigenvector will point along the, the direction of the second largest orthogonal direction of variance and so on and so forth until you've made your way through all of the dimensions of variability. You'll note that the original data set was simply, right, X and Y. And here we're getting a new set of axes. This is a change of basis is all this is, such that it's now X, right, not X, but PC1 and PC2. Note that these are still at right angles just as the original axes are. What this has done is the PCs have simply rotated our axes this way and scaled this first one to be five times the other one, such that you can properly explain the variance. Now, it's not the same axis. It's a combination of the variance, so it's a new axis. But fundamentally, what we're doing is we're rotating and scaling the data to come back and make it effectively unit variance. This is what principal components analysis does. And the reason it's so useful is because many different data sets have linear relationships to them. And if you can find these directions of linear relationships, you don't need to worry about the underlying total original number of dimensions that the data was originally written in. If you know in this particular two-dimensional case how to align yourself in this direction, you can largely ignore the second PC. Right? You can take what is originally a two-dimensional data set and convert it into a one-dimensional data set where you, all you really care about is how far in this direction the position of your sample is. Because if you know where you are on this position, you roughly know everything about it. You're, you might be a little off because you don't have this component, but isn't it a lot easier to deal with just one dimension than have to deal with two? Similarly, this gets exaggerated as the number of dimensions scale. So in many situations, particularly biological applications, you may have 100, 200, 1,000 dimensions, but most of the variance lies in a linear combination of a small number, 10, 20, 15, something like that. And it's so much easier to work in those lower dimensions than it is to work in the full dimensional space. That's the intuition behind principal components analysis. It's a mechanism by which you can find these, these vectors, right? these, these directions in space where most of the change of the data, most of the interesting fluctuation in the data can be explained, thus reducing your, your, the need for you to work in high dimensions. And it just so happens that if you approach this from a linear perspective, all it is is the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix such that the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix and the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix tell you the directions which you should, you should align your principal component vectors and they even tell you the order with which you need to label PC1, which explains the most variance, and PC2, which explains the second most variance, and PC3, which explains the third most variance. Here we only have two and that explains all the variance because there's nothing else. This is a two-dimensional uh, data set. But this is it. This is the concept behind PCA. Extremely powerful on one hand, but also extremely intuitive and straightforward once you understand what's going on with the covariance matrix and what it is and its relationship to eigenvectors and eigenvalues.